Okay. So we are in Jeremiah 16 tonight. <clears throat> and we're going to see that God told Jeremiah not to take a wife or have children. Now, we are going to see the love of God in the midst of his wrath. <clears throat> we need to remember that the Mosaic Covenant is a bilateral covenant where Israel and Judah um, had their end to uphold, and they did not uphold their end of that covenant. However, the Abrahamic Covenant is a unilateral covenant, a covenant that God made with Israel, and God alone keeps. He made it with Abraham first, uh, passed it on to Isaac, passed it on to Jacob. Now, the Abrahamic covenant has three parts to it. Number one is land. Uh, God promised the land of Canaan, known as Israel today, to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The second part of the covenant is seed. A person from the genealogy of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would become the Messiah, the Christ, the Savior of the world. And number three, the third part of the Abrahamic covenant was blessing. The Messiah will be a blessing to the whole world. And whoever blesses Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Israel, will be blessed. And whoever curses Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, will be cursed. And the main point tonight is the new covenant, the unilateral covenant made in Christ's blood, is what brings true children of Abraham back to God the Father. So, Stacy, I'll have you read Jeremiah 16, 1 and 2, please. The word of the Lord came to me. You shall not take a wife, nor shall you have sons or daughters in this place. Thank you. So what came to Jeremiah? The word of the Lord. The word of the Lord. And what did God tell Jeremiah not to take for himself? A wife. Don't take a wife. What else was Jeremiah not to have? Kids. Don't have any kids. Okay. Tracy, can you read 16.3, please? For thus says the Lord concerning the sons and daughters born in this place, and concerning their mothers who bear them, and their fathers who beget them in this land. Okay. Thank you. So who's speaking? The Lord. the Lord is. Okay. What four types of people is the Lord focusing on? Sons and daughters, mothers, fathers. Okay. Very good. Okay, Rob, can you read 16.4, please? They shall die of deadly diseases. They shall not be lamented, or nor shall they be buried. They shall be as dung on the surface of the ground. They shall perish by the sword and by famine, and their dead bodies shall be food for the birds of the air and for the beasts of the earth. Okay, so what is the first way they shall die? Diseases. Diseases. What two things shall not happen to those who die of deadly diseases? Not mourned or buried. What will they be as? Refuse. Lying on the ground. Refuse. Anyone else? Dung. Dung. This is not a pretty picture. What is the second way they're going to die? By the sword. By the sword. What is the third way they're going to die? Famine. What will their dead bodies become? Food for the birds. 
food for the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth. So why did God tell Jeremiah not to take a wife or have children? He'd lose them in a horrible way. <clears throat> By preventing Jeremiah from having a family, was he being overly restrictive or was he showing Jeremiah grace, mercy, and love? Grace, mercy, and love. Okay, Lori, 16.5, please. For thus says the Lord, Do not enter the house of mourning, or go to lament, or grieve for them, for I have taken away my peace from this people, my steadfast love and mercy, declares the Lord. Okay. Where was Jeremiah not to go to? The house of mourning. House of mourning. What was Jeremiah not to do? Lament. Lament or grieve. Excuse me. Grieve or mourn. What three reasons did God give Jeremiah not to mourn or lament over them? Took away his peace. Yeah. Steadfast love and mercy. Ugh. You guys have heard Daryl say this word in Sunday school. In Hebrew, it's hased. Loving kindness. What's that? Love his loving kindness. He's taking it away. <clears throat> Did they lose their salvation? You don't think so? You're correct. That no, they did not. <clears throat> they showed by their constant and reckless disobedience that they wanted a totally different God than the one of the Mosaic Covenant. Dennis, can you read 1616, please? 1616. Oh, 16.6, sorry. Oh, okay. Okay. Both great and small shall die in this land. They shall not be buried, and no one shall lament for them, or cut himself, or make himself bald for them. Okay. So who will die? Everyone. Yeah, both great and small. Will they be buried? Will anyone lament or mourn for them? No. What do you think nobody will cut themselves or make themselves bald for them mean? What do you think that means? That was like a pagan. It was a pagan thing. <clears throat> Helen, I'm going to read, have you read Leviticus 19, 26 to 29. Leviticus what? 16? 19? 19. Oh, I got me mixed up. 19 verse... Sorry, sorry. That's okay, no worries. Yeah. Leviticus 19, 19 verses 26 to Shall not eat any flesh with blood with the blood in it. You shall you shall not interpret omens or tell fortunes. You shall not round off the hair, the hair on your temples, or mar the edges of your hair. You shall not make any cuts on your body for the dead or tattoo yourselves. I am the Lord. Thank you. For twenty nine or twenty nine, yeah. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, you know what? Uh, Stop there. No, keep on going because yeah, one more. Okay. Do not profane your daughter by making her a prostitute, lest lest the land fall into prostitution, and the land become full of depravity. Thank you. Okay, so from what we read. Was this practice of making yourself bald or cutting yourself for the dead, was this a practice that God instituted or was it pagan? Yeah, it was borrowed from pagan. Yeah, it was pagan. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> what do you think God meant by nobody will cut themselves or make themselves bald for them? Let me tell you what I wrote down. The pagans, whose gods you, tu you turn to, <coughs> will not mourn for you. Both them and their gods hate you and want you dead. You went to them, <clears throat> and they didn't want you. Darcy, uh, Jeremiah 16, 7 to 8, please. <clears throat> no one shall break bread for the mourner to comfort him for the dead, nor shall anyone give him the cup of consolation to drink for his father or his mother. You shall not go into the house of feasting to sit with them to eat for and drink. How far was I going? Uh, to eight. Okay, that was it. So what won't people do? They won't show any comfort. Yeah. They won't, you know, they won't go to the meal after the funeral. They won't comfort anybody. I want you to think about this. This is worse than a COVID funeral. Yeah. <laughs> if no one is mourning you or comforting the bereaved, what did they really think of you? Zero. The gods that they turned to thought nothing of them. The people who worshipped those gods thought nothing of the Israelites. And how often does God call Israel his beloved? And yet they run to people and gods that don't want them. Jeremiah 16, 9, please, right? <clears throat> For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will cause to cease from this place before your eyes in, in your days the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, and the voice of the bride. Thank you. What two things does God have? <clears throat> what two things does God ha uh, have in this verse? Sorry. What two names does God have in this verse? I can't even read my own writing. The Lord of Hosts and the God of Israel. The Lord of Hosts and the God of Israel. What does the Lord of Hosts mean? Armies. Yeah, the God of Angel Armies. Could be. Could be. Uh, it sometimes I think was used with the Israelite armies too, but but yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. Well, the heavenly host. Yeah. Uh, I want you to think about this. If this is the God of angel armies, he is commander in chief over all of creation, both physical and spiritual. 
And now he's also the God of what? Israel. So we've got the God of macro and the God of micro. What four things will God silence? Maybe the sounds of joy and gladness, mm -hmm. and the voices of the bride, the bridegroom. There's going to be no happiness, no sadness. It's just going to be quiet. Sixteen ten, please, Greg. When you tell these people all this and they ask you, why has the Lord decreed such a great disaster against us? What wrong have we done? What sin have we committed against the Lord our God? <laughs> oh boy. What will the people ask when Jeremiah tells them this, these words? What did we do wrong? <laughs> Where should we begin? Yeah. So why do you think they will ask this? Let's think about it. It's one of two things. Either they're like, you know, whatever. Or are they serious? I think they're serious. I think they're serious yeah. too. Because they're so... They're so uh detached from reality that's what can happen with your mind if you go down deep enough you just lose all it's happening now with people yeah. saying i'm a good person i'll go yeah. to heaven because i'm a good person yeah, exactly. but they don't realize that you need god and, and plus Jesus. when they're justifying like some of these clips you see people they're they're in a frenzy because they can't uh give hormone treatment to kids mm -hmm. they're all in yeah. a they're all outraged. Over they're that. calling that draconian <laughs> measures because you cannot mutilate children. Mutilate minors, and and they're all angry about that. I know. So, I know. I mean, that that tells the story. Okay. <laughs> How far down <clears throat> people can go? Yeah. This is what I wrote down. They are choosing to listen to the false prophets, <clears throat> who would only pronounce blessings on them. First Timothy, is it Jane? Yeah. First Timothy four one and two, please. The Spirit clearly says that in later times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and thing, things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars who, conscience have been seared. With a hot iron. Mm -hmm. Consciences. Consciences? Okay. Yeah, that, that's good. That's good. What is the first way people will depart from the faith? Mm -hmm. By devoting themselves to the deceitful spirits. Mm -hmm. Yes, for following doctrines of demons. How will these demons teach in verse 2? Through the insincerity of liars. Through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Does that sound like today? Yes. Okay. Let's, um, Ivan, we're going to go back to Jeremiah 16. If you can read verses 10 to 12, please. And it shall be, when you show this people all these words, and they say to you, Why has the Lord pronounced all this great disaster against us? Or what is our inequity? Or what is our sin that we have committed against the Lord our God? Then you shall say to them, Because your fathers have forsaken me, says the Lord, they have walked after other gods, and have served them, and worshipped them, and have forsaken me, and not kept my law. Uh, 12 2? 12 2. 
and you have done worse than your fathers. For behold, each one follows the dedicates of his own evil heart, so that no one listens to me. Thank you. Why did they think they didn't sin? Yeah, you're correct. They held to demonic teachings through false teachers and false prophets. How was Jeremiah to answer them? Because your fathers have forsaken me, declares the Lord. You, you've done worse than your fathers. Yes, but your fathers have forsaken me. Did they follow God's law? They have forsaken God. They have forsaken God. And not followed his law. Stacy, can you read Matthew 5, 17 to 20, please? This is Jesus speaking. Matthew 5, 17 to 20. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, how, how far? 20. Okay. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay. So what did Jesus not come to do? To change the law. Yeah, or abolish it. I didn't come to change it or abolish it. What did he come to do? Fulfill the law and the prophets. How much righteousness will you need to get into heaven according to this? That surpasses the Pharisee and teachers of the law. Okay, so you, you got to look at the most righteous people, the most pious people in society... And your righteousness has to be exponentially past that to get into the kingdom of heaven. What did their fathers do to God in Jeremiah 16.11? Say that again, Rob. Forsaken the Lord. Forsaken the Lord. Is this, uh, I'm kind of wondering what fathers that's referring to. Is that like uh, going back to Israel? Ancestors. But how, is the ones in the wilderness? Is that, is it referring to? Um, very few generations of Israelites were godly. Very few. Tracy. 
Can you read Matthew 27, 45 to 54, please? Matthew 27, 45 to 54. Now from the sixth hour, darkness fell upon all the land until the ninth hour. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of those who were standing there, when they heard it, began saying, This man is calling for Elijah. Immediately one of them ran, and taking a sponge, he filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave him a drink. But the rest of them said, Let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now the centurion and those who were with him, keeping guard over Jesus, when they saw the earthquake and the things that were happening, became very frightened and said, Truly this was the Son of God. Thank you. <clears throat> what is the first thing Jesus cried out on the cross in this passage? God, my God, why have you persisted me? Who did not keep the law in the Old Testament? Israel. Yeah, the Israelites. They did not keep the law. Who kept the law in the New Testament? Jesus. Okay. Who forsook who in Jeremiah 16? Yeah. Your fathers forsook God, and you have forsaken God. Who forsook Jesus? In Matthew 27. God the Father. What was the first thing that happened the moment Jesus died? How was it torn? Okay, this curtain was hundreds of pounds. It separated the inner sanctuary from the Holy of Holies. And only the high priest once a year could go into the Holy of Holies to make a sacrifice once a year. And the moment Jesus died, this curtain... Hundreds of pounds is torn from two, top to bottom. So what does that signify? It signifies that now, because of Christ's death, that we have access to God the Father. We are now welcome into the most holy place because of what Christ did on the cross. What did the Romans come to understand through this? Surely this was the Son of God. The first people to realize this are not Jewish people. They're Gentiles. Is it Rob's turn? Rob, Isaiah 53, 10 to 11, please. Isaiah is one book before Jeremiah. 54? 53, 10 to 11. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. 
when his soul makes an offering for guilt. He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Thank you. So whose will was it to do this? Whose will was it to put Jesus to death? The Lord. The Lord's will. What did his soul make? An offering. An offering for what? Guilt. For guilt. What will happen <laughs> through the knowledge of Jesus Christ? Verse 11. Many will. Yeah. Be accounted righteous. Through the knowledge of Jesus Christ, many will be accounted righteous. Now, according to Matthew um, chapter 5, from Jesus' words, how righteous do you need to be to get into the kingdom of heaven? What must your righteousness surpass? The Pharisees and, the... and the scribes. Exponentially passed. Okay. So, but aren't we not relying on Jesus' righteousness? We'll get there. What will Christ bear here? In verse 11. Their iniquities. Okay, so... According to verse 11, what will the knowledge of Jesus Christ do for us? Make many to be accounted righteous. Okay, great. Uh, whose turn is it? Mine. Yours? 2 Corinthians 5.21, please. This is a verse that you are going to want to remember. 521. This is one of those verses that you will want to memorize. Yeah? <laughs> For our sake he made him to be sin, he who, he who knew no sin, that in him we might become, right, become the righteousness of God. Okay, this is where we get the doctrine of double imputation from. Isaiah 53, 10 and 11, and 2 Corinthians 5, 21. The doctrine of double, uh, of double imputation, it sounds really heady, right? Think about imputing something on a computer. You do it twice. Double imputation. We, or God, imputed our sin onto Jesus Christ. In return, Jesus Christ imputed all 100% of his God righteousness onto us. Now, that because of what Christ did on the cross, and we have 100% God righteousness through his gift of mercy and grace on the cross, is our righteousness, righteousness now surpassing the scribes and the Pharisees? Yes. Okay. Now, let's read, uh, who's turning, uh, Dennis, Luke 22, 14 to 20. Luke 22, 14 to 20. <clears throat> Okay, 
Luke 22, 14, 20. And when the hour came, he reclined at table, and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Thank you. How badly did Jesus want to eat this Passover with his disciples? Eagerly. Very eagerly. Okay. This is something Jesus wanted to do. This is Jesus' idea. When will Jesus drink the wine again? Verse 18. Until the kingdom of God comes. What does the bread represent here? His body. His broken body. In verse 20, what does the wine represent? His blood for what? Shed for us. What, what does it say? Covenant. For the what? The new covenant. For the new covenant. Okay, we've talked about the Mosaic Covenant. We've talked about the Abrahamic Covenant. What's this new covenant? Helen, Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34, please. Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke. Oh. Yeah. Though I was their husband, declares the Lord. Sorry, how far? Uh, to 34. Okay, thank you. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each, and no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall know me. From the least of them to, to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. What will God make with the Israel in Judah? Verse 31. A new covenant. A new covenant. What will this covenant not be like not like the old one not like the mosaic covenant who broke the mosaic covenant the jewish people the, jewish people, the israelites when will god make this covenant in verse 33 After those days. Hmm. Okay. What will God put in them and write on their hearts? His law. What will God do with their iniquity 
and how long will he remember their sin? He's going to forget the iniquities and forget their sin. Wow. <clears throat> Whose blood has secured this covenant? Oh. Is Christ God? Yes. Is this a unilateral or bilateral covenant? Unilateral. unilateral. Mosaic is a bilateral. The new covenant is a unilateral. One person makes it, one person keeps it. Because this new covenant is a unilateral covenant made by God himself and secured by his blood that is not tainted by Adam's sin, all who are part of this covenant can never be exempted from it. Okay. Okay. Whose turn is it, Darcy? Back to Jeremiah 16, 11 to 13, please. Yeah, 16, 11 to 13. Then you shall say to them, Because your fathers have forsaken me, declares the Lord, and have gone after other gods, and have served and worshipped them, and have forsaken me, and have not kept my law. And because you have done worse than your fathers, for behold, every one of you follows his stubborn, evil will, refusing to listen to me. Therefore I will hurl you out of this land, into a land that neither you nor your fathers have known, and there you shall serve other gods day and night, for I will show you no favor. Well, okay. What will God do to them in verse 13? Cast them out of the land. Was this part of the curses in the Mosaic Covenant? We got a 50-50 chance on this one. <laughs> yes, yes it is. Okay. Now, here's some interesting things for you. The Hebrew word for hurl is tool. T-E-W-L. The Greek Septuagint translation for tool is... Anyone? Anyone? Harpazo. The Latin translation for harpazo or tool is rapturo. rapturo, where we get our English word rapture from. <clears throat> they are getting kicked out of their land for their sins. How can this be rapture? You're being forced out. Okay. Being... Yeah, harpazo is also where we get our word harpoon from. Okay? To be removed by force. Out of all the forms of wrathful destruction that we've read in this chapter so far, who are the only ones who were not destroyed? No. The few that obeyed his laws. Okay. People are going to, he told, God told Jeremiah, don't take a wife, don't have any children. Then he talks about what's going to happen to all the men, women, and children. What three ways are they going to die? Pestilence. 
Okay, is anyone going to mourn for them? No. No. What are their bodies going to be like? Refuse. Refuse or dung. Okay. Now we have a group of people that are going to be hurled out of the land. Who are the only ones that aren't killed? The ones who obeyed. The ones who willingly obeyed and left the land. Being hurled out. After I wrote this, something came into my mind. It's really interesting. When you teach, you learn a lot more than what you can teach. And this is going to be quite the rabbit trail, but hold on here. When Adam sinned, there was a curse put on the land, right? If you remember going through Genesis, we learned about Ham who raped his mother. The son of Noah who raped his mother. He uncovered his father's nakedness. You read in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, that means you slept with your mom. Now, notice Ham doesn't get a blessing or a curse. But (coughs) his son Canaan is cursed. And he did nothing because of what his father did. And yet we see on Adam's end, we have a lineage of people who will get saved. We see in Canaan, the cursed people, we see some people who are not only saved, but are part of Christ's genealogy, like Rahab, right? So what I'm getting at is, there's a story inside the story. And so the second story is like an illustration of the first story. Is that making sense? What happened to Adam and Eve after they sinned? Were they allowed to stay in Eden? What did God do? Okay. Now, last year we went through Revelation. What happens at the end? White throne judgment, you mean? Oh, that's at no after the white throne judgment. Where do people come back to? New heaven and new earth. Back to Eden. They come back. What do we see? With Israel, they get, it's a story inside a story. They get kicked out. And what happens? They come back. Now, out of all the forms of wrathful destruction who are The only ones who were not destroyed. The ones who were kicked out. The ones who were raptured. Now, whose turn is it? John 15, 1, please. I am the true vine, and my father... Is the vine dresser. Okay, thank you. So, who is Jesus? True vine. The true vine. Okay, I want you guys to circle that word true. Now, <clears throat> there are three plants or trees represent Israel. What are they? Fig 
big tree, the great vine, and uh, the olive tree. Olive tree. Okay. So you have the fig tree, the grapevine, and the olive tree. And Jesus is calling himself the true vine. So what is Jesus really calling himself? Jesus. Okay. What plants or trees represent Israel? Well, the olive. The olive, the fig, and... Okay, and Jesus is calling himself the true vine. So what is Jesus really calling himself? The true God. Okay, what represents Israel? What three trees? The vine, the great vine. Okay, and so if Jesus is the true vine, what is he calling himself? The true God. The true Israel. I'm true Israel. I'm the promised seed from the Abrahamic covenant. I'm the blessing. This is my land. Right? Okay. <coughs> what we are seeing here is a contrast. Israel Judah did not keep the law. Jesus, true Israel, and the promised king of Judah kept the whole law. Israel forsook God. God the Father forsook true Israel, Jesus Christ. The Lord poured his wrath on Israel and Judah because of their sin. The Father poured his wrath for me and my sin on Jesus, true Israel. The, Mo the Mosaic covenant was broken. The new covenant can never be broken. Those who were quote unquote raptured went raptured went by faithful obedience. The new covenant, God writes his law on our hearts and our obedience. Obedience proves our salvation. So, before Christ, mm -hmm. in Abraham's bosom, mm -hmm. in his 80s, and it was one side, and then the other side was paradise. Yeah, so Abraham's so what, bosom would be paradise. So, what, what determined whether you went to Hades side or paradise? Mm. Very good. Was Job an Israelite? Uh, yes. No, he was not. But if you look at the genealogies of his friends, one of his friends comes from the line of Esau. Okay? And he's a godly man also. But what did Job say? I know my Redeemer lives. What do we read about Job in the first chapter? His sons and daughters would have feasts. And after these feasts, Job would go out and sacrifice just in case his sons and daughters sinned. Will the blood of bull, bull, um, bulls and goats ever save you? No. But what, why did 
God institute with the Israelite people? We're going away from Job here for a second, but why did God institute with the Israelite people a sacrificial system if it can't take away your sin? Just to show obedience. Okay, so why didn't you just tell him to tie his shoes? That's obedience. Well, in Hebrews it says without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. So That's right. It's teaching transference of sin to a sacrifice. Okay. A victim, an innocent victim. Okay, great. Now we're getting somewhere to the innocent victim, which is pointing towards who? Jesus. Towards Jesus. And we see in the very first promise... One is coming where Satan will bite his heel, but Jesus will crush Satan's head. So there's going to be some sort of sacrifice that kills the power of Satan. Very first promise. And then we see it lived out by God at the end of chapter 3. When God makes clothes out of animal skins, God had to perform the first sacrifice. And he's showing this is what's going to happen with this Mashiach, with this Messiah. So as they went to sacrifice, they were putting their hope in the Redeemer who would be the better sacrifice, okay? So it wasn't the sacrificing that saved them. It was the hope and the faith in the one to come. We're, the, we're saved the same way, except in a mirror. They were looking forward to what would happen on the cross, and we look backwards. Yeah, and uh, you guys were studying Exodus. Uh, they sacrificed a lamb, and they had to uh, brush the blood on the yep. post and on the yep. to be spared from the angel of death that night. And then also John the Baptist called Jesus. He introduced him as the, the Lamb, lamb of, of God the, that yeah. takes away the sin yeah. of the world. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Whose turn is it? Yours, Jane? 16, 14 to 15, please. However, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when when men will no longer say, as surely as the Lord lives, who brought the Israelites up out of Egypt? But they will say, as surely as the Lord lives, who brought the Israelites up out of the land of the north? And out of the countries where he had banished them. For I will restore them to the land I gave their forefathers. Isn't that interesting? What did the Israelites, Israelite people used to say? The days are coming. The days are coming what? Declares the Lord. Okay, what would the Israelites say? As the Lord brought us out of... Egypt. Okay. And what will they say in the future? As surely as the Lord lives, he brought the Israelites up out of the land of the Lord. Okay, so why will they say that? Oh, they're getting back their land or their forefathers. That's right, because God's going to bring them back. <clears throat> so... Where did where's God driving them to? What country? Babylon. Babylon. Okay. Here's something interesting. And maybe you guys don't think about it that often. They were kicked out of the land twice. 586 BC, what this is talking about. Okay. And 70 A.D., the Roman Emperor Titus. In 586 B.C., Solomon's temple was destroyed and they were kicked out. In 70 A.D., Herod's temple was destroyed and they were kicked out. 
Okay. 1616, please, Ivan. Behold, I will send for many fishermen, says the Lord, and they shall fish them. And afterward, I will send for many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain and every hill and out of the holes of the rocks. So, what is God sending for? What do people? What two types of people? Fishermen and hunters. Fishermen and hunters. Where will the fishers and hunters find them? Mountains, hills, Mountains, crevices. hills crevices, everything. They're pulling them out to bring them back. Jeremiah 16, 17, please, Stacy. For my eyes are on all their ways. They are not hidden from me, nor is their iniquity concealed from my eyes. Okay, okay. What are, guy, what, what are God's eyes on? All their ways. All their ways, okay. What is not hidden from God? Nothing. Everything is he, he sees everything that they do. Is God going to overlook their sin in this verse? No. No. Okay, Tracy, uh, Jeremiah 16, 18. I will first doubly repay their iniquity and their sin, because they have polluted my land, they have filled my inheritance with the carcasses of their detestable idols and with their abominations. Okay, what is God going to do first? Doubly repay their iniquity. Okay, you might want to circle doubly repay. Who is going to doubly repay for their sin? God's going to doubly repay. Rob, can you read Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 20? Colossians 1, 15 to 20. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him we all for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile him to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the of his cross. Okay. What birth <clears throat> birthplace or birth sorry, what birthright position does Jesus have according to Colossians 1? Firstborn, of firstborn. Okay. So he's firstborn over all creation. That does not mean he's created. That's his position. Okay. He's also the firstborn from the dead. What position of the inheritance does the firstborn get? All of it. No. no. You guys remember? Double portion. Oh, isn't this sounding like Jeremiah? According to Jeremiah 16, 18, 
who paid this double portion? The Lord. I will repay doubly the firstborn, where the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Note, Israel and Judah lost their national sovereignty in 586 B.C. at the destruction of Jerusalem. Even though they came back 70 years later, they were always a province of another nation until 70 A.D. when the Roman Emperor Titus kicked them out he kept them all out of, uh, out of Judea. They did not return. They did, sorry, they, they did not regain their national sovereignty again until May 14th, 1948. Judah, Israel, has paid twice for breaking the Mosaic Covenant. They've been kicked out in 586 B.C. and 70 A.D. However, please note, they were not given their national sovereignty back until after Jesus made a double portion payment for them on the cross. Just like what Jeremiah says. Whose turn is it? He made that payment before 70 AD. Then. He made the payment, but they did not come back for national sovereignty until yeah. after it was made. 1948. 1948. Okay. Whose turn is it? Yours, Jeremiah 16, 19, please. O Lord, my strength and my stronghold, my refuge in the day of trouble, to you shall the nations come from the ends of the north and say, our fathers have inherited nothing but lies, worthless, worthless things in which there is no profit. Okay. What does Jeremiah call the Lord? His stronghold. His strength and stronghold. Okay. <clears throat> Who will come to the Lord? The nations will come. The nations. Where will they come from? Everywhere, ends of the earth. From all the ends of the earth. What will they say? There's nothing but false gods and worthless idols. That's right. 1620, please, Dennis. Can a man make for himself gods? Such are not. Is this a rhetorical question by them? Yes, it is. So what are they actually saying? Well, they're saying that uh, sounds to me like uh, they're, they're coming up to the senses that they've been wasting their lives and suffering because they were following gods that were not gods at all. You got it. And now they want to have the right God. You're right. Yeah. They're saying the gods we have are nothing. Jeremiah 16, 21, please, Helen. Therefore, behold, I will make them know. This one, sorry. Therefore, behold, I will make them know. This once I will make them know my power and my might. And they shall know that, that my name is the Lord. Okay. What does therefore mean? What is it there for? That, exactly. What is it there for? <laughs> because of what I just said. So because of this therefore, who is them? The nations. The nations. Not the Israelites. The nations. 
my, my version says the Gentiles. Yeah. How many times will God make the nations know? Once. Once. How many times was Israel and Judah kicked out of the land? Twice, 586 BC and 70 AD. Is God using this as an example? No. He's not using Israel as an example. So what is he showing the nations once? So they will know his power, his might, and that his name is the Lord. What's the only thing that God has done once that we talked about tonight? Given up his son. Given up his son on the cross. This is a one time deal. And on the cross, you will know my power, and you will know my might, and you will know my name. Hebrews 10, 11 to 12, please, Darcy. Hebrews 10, 11 to 12. Every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Thank you. When did the priests finally finish the sacrifices? Trick question. You got it. They never did. How many times did Jesus pay for sin? Once and once only. It was a better sacrifice. Not just better, the well, best. Yeah, a better sacrifice than chapter 1. Yeah. Ray, Hebrews 12, 1 to 2. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Thank you. So why do we look to Jesus? He's the author and finisher of our faith. He's the author and finisher of our faith. What was set before him? The cross. Oh, before the cross, it says the joy. The joy. Circle that. We're going to come back to that. What did he do because of the joy set before him? He endured the cross. He endured the cross. Where is he seated? At the right hand of God. Could a human priest sit? No. Why not? They had to, the high priest had to atone for his own <coughs> sin. He had to slaughter a ram. He was still You're getting there. Yeah. Continuously. Continuously. Yeah. They yeah. could not stop because yeah. 
You could not sa you could sacrifice every animal in the world, and it's not enough blood to cover our sin. So could a human priest sit? No, why not? Because animal blood, blood can't pay for sin. What does sitting beside the Father mean? That is, that is favor, his right hand of favor. Is that what you're getting at? No. This job is done. The job is done. It is finished. What is the last Thing Jesus said on the cross it is finished Greek word is totelestai which means paid in full What is this joy set before him that made him endure the cross? One that he was going to be seated at the right hand of the Father. No. He was already at the right hand of the Father in eternity. What is this joy set before him that made him endure the cross? You. You. Jesus wants you. That's why he was eager to have this Passover with his disciples. For the joy set before him, he took the wrath of God. He gives us an example of what the wrath of God looks like with the diseased people that die and no one's mourning them. And they're like dung on the street. And those who die by the sword. And those that die by famine. Do you see the horror of God's wrath? I took that for you. I... Tooled you, I harpotzled you, I raptured you away from the wrath of God, and I will bring you back. And when the great tribulation comes, what's happening? Are we still sinful people? Yes, but we're made righteous. He has by what Christ has done on the cross. He has taken my sin and given me his 100% righteousness. And that is why when the great tribulation comes, we are not going to have a part of it. Just like the faithful in Judah, he will rapture us out. So we don't experience the wrath. And then we come back with him. Not everybody gets raptured. No, only believers. You can either take the wrath of God on yourself like the Israelites did, or you can have Jesus take the wrath of God. One, you will never finish paying off that wrath. The other was a one-time payment, paid in full. Which brings us to our conclusion. Number one, God's wrath 
is very real and very destructive. Number two, there is a biblical way to mourn and a paganistic way to mourn. Don't mourn paganistically. Number three, there are many people today who call themselves Christian who refuse to know what God says in the Bible and they don't care. They want their own false teachers. Number four. God will rapture the faithful. Number five. Jesus is true Israel. Number six. Only Jesus has fulfilled the law. Number seven. Only Jesus could take the full wrath of God for us. Number eight. God takes covenants very seriously. Number nine, Jesus secured your salvation in the new covenant by fulfilling the Mosaic covenant. And number 10, the new covenant in Christ can never be broken because it was completed once and for all. Stacy, can you pray for us tonight?